proud of her ability to argue against the Bible. I would bring the Bible to school with post-it notes where all the contradictions were, and then I would say, tell me why this isn't a contradiction, and they couldn't really do it. An atheist meets her match. I started seeing maybe there are these cracks in my own intellectual framework. Find how a children's book challenged her beliefs, plus a friend of sinners. Why Pastor Rich Wilkerson Jr. has taken heat over his celebrity friendships on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Here's Ephraim Graham with this week's top five stories from Studio Five. At number five. I Can Only Imagine posted a stronger showing at the box office than critics expected, finishing third opening weekend with $17.1 million. That's double what it was expected to make. I don't want to go on any more adventures with you. The movie tells the story of lead singer of Mercy Me, Bart Miller, and what led him to write the best-selling Christian single of all time. You know, I want you to know that I pray for you all the time. I do. I really do. And I hope that you find whatever it is that you're looking for out there. You play the role of Bart's wife in this film. How would you describe what she was to him during those dark times? I think that Shannon Millard uh, had a lot more vision for Bart's life than he had for himself. Um, I think that she early on uh, recognized um, God's call on his life and recognized that he had something special despite where he was coming from. And so I think um, for him, she kind of was like this um, propeller into his calling. She kind of always was um, giving him his words of, you know, affirmation and pushing him forward in life. And um, you see that in the film, but I mean, much more in real life. At number four. You recently left Lakewood, man. Well, we're we're in the process, process of, of leaving. Yeah, yeah. We're we're moving to Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, Pastor John Gray opens up about his decision to leave Lakewood, one of the largest churches in America. I was serving Pastor Joel and Pastor Victoria's vision. We served that vision and we thank God for that. But you know, there comes a time when there's a vision in you. Right. And it just depends on the right place to launch it. The comedian, author, and singer replaces departing Pastor Ron Carpenter at Redemption Church in Greenville, South Carolina. And the church will be renamed Relentless Church. The response has been overwhelming, but honestly, the truth is, past all of that, we felt like God told us that's where we need to be. At number three, he's back. It's been rumored for a while. Now Steven Spielberg has confirmed we're going to get a fifth Indiana Jones film. And yes, Harrison Ford will star in it. Spielberg revealed the news at the Empire Awards in London. He said production will begin next month in the UK. And just imagine, this is a series Spielberg once wanted to end. When I was done with Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, there was a reason that I invented the shot of Harrison riding a horse into the sunset because I thought that brought the curtain down on the trilogy and then we were all gonna move on and mature into other aspects of filmmaking and I never thought I would ever see Indiana Jones again. And Harrison was tenacious and Harrison called George and got George thinking about it then George called me and he said, well, Steve, what do you wanna do? It could be fun to make another movie and I, I was the holdout. I was the one that said, I'm done with this series. It was great, let's walk away. At number two. The Gospel Music Association adds four new members to its Hall of Fame. The legendary staple singers are among them. Just like you said, he will rise from the dead. He's alive with glory forever. Christian music star Carmen. Music producer Greg Nelson. I know you understand would you hold me while I cry and Southern Gospels Karen Peck the ceremony also celebrates charitable organizations spearheaded by celebrities my own son defriended me <laughs> comedian Shonda Pierce and singer Pastor Marvin Sapp are among those being honored this year the Hall of Fame ceremony will take place May 8th in Nashville at number one. Send a message to all those that follow our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a terrible evil in the world, 
darkness is spreading. Paul, Apostle of Christ, hits American theaters this week, and Studio 5 has this first look at a scene from the film. We've loved this city as our own. Only see what it's become. Nero's wrong. Nero's madness. We will pass. He can't be emperor forever. Many more people will die before then. This decision weighs heavily on me. I receive no wisdom in prayer. In staying, we put the lives of all our brothers and sisters under this roof in danger. The film is in American theaters Friday. Will that rely on us? Do we condemn to a terrible fate? Chris was clear when he said he was sending us out. For all the latest in entertainment news, check out Ephraim's weekly show, Studio 5. You can watch it online at cbn.com slash studio5. Well, up next, why this pastor and author believes one of Jesus' favorite nicknames was Friend of Sinners. Rich Wilkerson Jr. joins us right after this. Well, back in 2014, Rich Wilkerson Jr. officiated the marriage of Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. Some folks in the Christian community then questioned his ties to Hollywood's rich and famous. But Rich believes Christians, like Jesus, should be friends of sinners. Take a look. Rich Wilkerson Jr. is the pastor of Voo Church in Miami, Florida. He's also the pastor to celebrities and professional athletes, which means Rich gets a lot of questions about who he spends time with and why. I believe everybody in the world is hungry to get a glimpse of who Jesus is but many times it's church people who are unwilling to get out of the way and therefore they can't see him. In his book, Friend of Sinners, Rich shines a spotlight on a powerful message of faith, hope, and grace that will impact your life forever. Well, Rich is with us, and Rich, great to have you. Thank you so much for letting me come on. I appreciate yeah. it. Always fun to be here. What's it like to be really famous? <laughs> oh, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to ask you that question. <laughs> uh, I'm just honestly honored to be here and excited to talk about this book. It just came out a week ago, and it's been really, really received well so far. Were you surprised that you were critiqued within the Christian community for performing a wedding? I, it's like kind of like not surprised, but but wish I was surprised, wish it wasn't so mm. um, confusing to people. I, a couple of years ago, I had a book come out called Sandcastle Kings, which was talking about building a life on Jesus. And while I was doing some of this stuff, press, talking to people, I was always amazed how they didn't want to talk about the book. They wanted to talk about people that you're associated with and people you're hanging out with. And that's what really created this desire to say, man, I, I think the world needs to know and be reminded who Jesus was and what he did while he was on this earth. He was constantly in places in spaces that people thought that a man of God should not be in. However, he was there because of his love for people, his love to reach people. I think the response of every believer should be to mimic their savior, Jesus Christ. Well, uh, wh why do Christians do it, I guess is the question. And, you know, I've heard it said for decades, you know, Christians are the only group that kill and eat yeah, their own. Right? <laughs> and it, you know, we laugh about it, but at the same time, it still hurts uh, when people come at you. I mean, you're, you're tr just trying to represent Jesus in places where he needs to be represented, so. Yeah. I have a friend who um, like is new on the faith. He's on the journey of faith. Uh -huh. And so I was telling him about a year and a half ago when I started writing this book, I said, I'm writing this book called Friend of Sinners. And he looked at me so seriously, he said, bro, you cannot do that. Your friends will be so mad at you. And I started <laughs> to laugh. I said, no, 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 you, this is why I'm writing the book. The book's not about me. The book's about, is about Jesus. I think what happens to us on the journey is it's like this book foremost is, is the book about the gospel. It's about God's love. Paul will write to the church over and over again. Let me remind you of the gospel. Every local church pastor knows their job is not, 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 not preach something new, but to preach the same message over and over again in a new way, in a new angle, a new perspective that people can be reminded of God's grace, God's mercy, God's love. The reason why is because whatever you're full of, is what you're gonna be led by. And so I think what happens to a lot of us as believers is the longer we follow Jesus sometimes, sometimes we forget about just the fact that he saved us. I wanna live my life in a perpetual state of being grateful and thankful for the grace of God. Because really, who am I in this story? I am the sinner. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. And when he said that, it's like, oh, that's a tweetable line, that's good. But what he was really saying is that 
you have to recognize that you're sick for relationship with me to begin. So I want to be good at saying, yo, if God is like the moon and we're here on earth and his perfection is the moon, well, you know, you're a good athlete. You could probably jump a little bit higher than I can, but, but ultimately like if the moon's the goal, we're both pretty far off. And that's where we all are at when, it compa- when we're compared to us, to God. And so I think that believers, if we're not careful, it's like we can get saved. And then we kind of take that as like a salvation card, like we're in that we did something that other people didn't do. All we did was believe in his grace and receive his mercy. And I think if we're reminded of the gospel, it's gonna put us in a state to have mercy, grace, and love for other people. So I I think we just forget. Uh, How do you deal with the critiques? Does it get under your skin? Do you have to have a moment to say, (laughs) I'm not not being Christ-like right now? (laughs) Right, right, right. right. Um, I I think every year I try to get better at it. I think hopefully as I get older and as I mature more and more, I think that I've got foundational friends, people that I'm on the journey with, that we have the same convictions. We believe in God's word. There's a direction that we think God has pointed us in. We have a mission on this earth. Those are the voices that I'm listening to and want to hear the most. My dad, my father-in-law. Um, these are voices that want, hey, is there something you're seeing in my life right now that doesn't adhere to what we believe in or it's not abiding by the convictions that I feel like I've I've conveyed to you that I want to live my life by. Because if, if I listen too much to the criticism and too much to the naysayers, there's always naysayers. I mean, come on, Jesus, they killed him. Like, why is it that we think that if we're going to follow Jesus that we won't experience criticism? Mm-hmm. I think with the work that you guys have done here and your tenacity and your perseverance to take the gospel into spaces that many people say, hey, this doesn't belong there. You've received criticism on the journey. But if you listen to that criticism for too long, it'll only slow you down. And so I'm constantly learning. I I have no means mastered this, but I try to guard my eyes and guard my ears from how much of it I see and how much of it I listen to. I want to make sure that I'm I'm getting the right voices in. Yeah, I'll I'll tell a story from CBN's history. It was all all the way back in the 1960s, so you weren't even born. Um, But it it was um, Scott Ross was trying to do outreach to... Uh, what were then called the hippies. And so he brought in a uh, rock group to play, and then he would do commentary and talk about, um, you know, life. Yeah, pretty progressive stuff. And life from the perspective of a a Christian. And he was using the music to try to attract viewers. And uh, the Pharisees arrived, and uh, at that point, we had just built a new building on Spratly Street in Portsmouth, Virginia, and so there was this, you know, the Holy Temple. And so people were saying, oh, no, he's bringing long-haired rock musicians yeah. into the Holy Temple. You can't do this. And my father came out of his office, and he was upstairs, and he started walking down the, the steps. And he said, the moment this building becomes more important than those young men mm. is the moment I burn this building down. Wow. Wow. I love that. So you got, you, from yeah. my standpoint, you've got to take the stand. What are you in ministry for? Exactly. Are you, are you trying to have a holy club or are you trying to reach the world? Are you trying to reach the lost? And, and, and I think your book is important, not just for, um, you know, Christians, but I think we're, we need to start making a cultural statement. Mm. Who are we in exactly. the world? Are, are we really salt and light? Are we really trying to preserve? Uh, and reach, or are we, are we getting more and more insular? Well, I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, marry your mission, date your method. <laughs> you know, and methods come and go. And the mission is, mm-hmm. is that we're called to be salt and light. Yet I think being salt and light means that you're living your life in a way that makes people thirsty for Jesus. There's something about you that's attractive. Somehow we've got this mentality sometimes in church where it's like, you know, we're in, but not of. But some people live like they're not even in. Like they just fully want to remove themselves from the world. And if you're not in the world, you can't change the world. You can't make a difference in the world. And I love this word sinner. I, the reason why it's a pink book is because like the title's pretty like provocative, like friend of sinner. So we're like, let's put something very, very subtle and pink behind it. Because the idea is I think they're the wrong definition. I think people have the wrong definition of sinner. We think that sinner is all about morality and behavior modification. But you and I who've studied the gospel realize that no sin has a much deeper consequence than being a bad boy or a bad girl. It's rendered us dead. So Christ has not come to make bad people good. He's come to make dead people alive. Yeah. And there's not degrees of death. You're just dead. And so we all start in the same place. And I think as the church of Jesus Christ and as followers of Jesus, we need to realize that we have the best message in the world. It's good news. 
and it's death to life type of preaching. And I think we need to share that with our lives and we should love people and let God change people. Yeah. We're all about, let's break down that wall of separation. Sure. You guys Not are doing between it. between people, but between people and God. Yeah. And when God invades, then things change. Let's go. Yeah. Amen. All right. Friend of Sinners. Thank you. It's a book um, uh, that's available everywhere. Why Jesus Cares More About Relationship Than Perfection. Uh, I encourage you to get it if you're interested in how do we reach our culture today. Come yeah. on. So Thank appreciate you. you guys. Thanks for having appreciate me. Appreciate you. Well, coming up at 11 years of age, she decided there was no God, and intellectualism became her identity. I'm the smartest one in the room, right? I'm not the prettiest, I'm not the most athletic, right? I'm the smartest. Find out why this Harvard grad left atheism. That's up next. When Jordan Manji was a middle schooler, she tried to get under God taken out of the Pledge of Allegiance. Jordan was smart, and everyone knew it. As an atheist, she used her brain to attack Christianity. And then, one day, while in college, Jordan realized that she had a lot to learn. One of the hardest things as an atheist is that all of these values, why am I important? Why should people care about me? A lot of those things come from your own performance. As the daughter of two atheists, Jordan Manji felt she had a lot to prove. You have to understand, my family is very competitive. There's always been a high priority on being the best. So much of my identity was founded on I'm the smartest one in the room, right? I'm not the prettiest, I'm not the most athletic, right? I'm the smartest. At 11 years old, Jordan decided there was no God and began openly challenging her Christian classmates. I would bring the Bible to school with post-it notes where all the contradictions were, and then I would say, tell me why this isn't a contradiction, and they couldn't really do it. But in high school, Jordan started to see a contradiction in her own beliefs. She considered herself a good person, but that raised a question she couldn't answer. Where does morality come from, if not from God? Why is something right or wrong? Why do I believe in human rights? I don't believe in a God, so where are these things coming from? I had gone and asked all of these other people and nobody had a good answer. I had this kind of epiphany where I said, I'm gonna wait until college to explore those questions so that I can get into a good school. And that worked out pretty well because I got into Harvard. There, she quickly discovered she was no longer at the top of the class. Now being surrounded by people with whom I'm no longer the smartest person in the room 95% of the time, it destroys that sense of identity and of worth, and it makes you wonder, who really am I and what makes me valuable? As Jordan began to question her worth, she became friends with Joseph Porter, a Christian conservative who gave her even more questions to think about. It really started pressing me on where does your morality come from? Why do you believe in it? You're just saying it kind of emerges from nowhere. I started seeing maybe there are these cracks in my own intellectual framework. Jordan enrolled into a meta-ethics class, hoping to find answers that would strengthen her argument. Instead, she was assigned a short reading assignment, an essay by C.S. Lewis. Essentially what C.S. Lewis says is, God is goodness. God is the good. And our lives are good when we strive to imitate God. It was mind blowing. Jordan wanted to explore this idea further, so she decided to read the Bible again. This time she would try to understand it, not critique it. And when she read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, she was struck by what he said about what it means to be good. As an atheist, I was living life better, according to a Christian ethic, than a lot of Christians were. Like I wasn't sleeping around, I wasn't doing drugs, I wasn't drinking, I was a good student. And so it was very easy for me to think of myself as a good person. And it was only when I went back to the words of Jesus and I saw, no, you're an angry person. You may not be sleeping around, but you experience lust. You are very arrogant. You think too highly of yourself. Seeing those things made me realize that I wasn't really a good person. Maybe there's some truth here that I haven't figured out yet. Maybe I don't know the best way to run my life. Jordan kept reading until she came to John 19. I had finally made it to the 
crucifixion scene. And as I was reading it, I had this moment where I just said, no, Aslan, no. For years, Jordan believed C.S. Lewis's The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe was just a story. But now as she read of Jesus' crucifixion, she realized her favorite tale from Narnia was more than a work of fiction. Aslan, the great lion of Lewis's story, was Jesus. And she was just like Edmund, arrogant, but redeemed. It just immediately clicked, like, I am Edmund, Jesus is Aslan, and he is dying for my sake. Seeing it now with me in the story was just a totally radically new way of looking at it and realizing kind of my own sinfulness in that moment and my own need for healing from that sin made all the difference in how I read it. And so I started just crying, thinking about, really thinking about Aslan, but thinking about Jesus through that process. Realizing in that moment that you're Edmund is to realize I'm powerless. I need help. I recognized my own incurable need for forgiveness that could only come from Jesus Christ. Still, that wasn't enough to break Jordan's deeply rooted need for intellectual evidence of God. So she poured over every scientific argument, analyzed every prominent religion, and all the evidence pointed her back to Jesus Christ. One of the things that helped me the most to eliminate my pride was having to admit that I had been wrong all of those years as an atheist. Ultimately, it came down to a profound yet simple truth. As I thought about what love really was, I could see how Jesus' death on the cross was the perfect embodiment of that. God is love and God is truth. So God is goodness. It was at that point when I realized, if I want to try this Christianity business, I can't do it half-heartedly. I have to be fully committed. On April 12, 2009, Jordan gave her life to Jesus. Since then, she has grown even stronger in her faith. She graduated from Harvard in 2012, recently married, and is currently pursuing a doctoral degree at Fuller Theological Seminary. But she says none of that determines her value. What is man that God is mindful of him? What am I that I have value? So long, my value had come from the things that I had done. So moving to a framework where instead, the reason I knew I was valuable was because Christ had died for me, that he loved me regardless of what I would ever do. It's immensely freeing. David, King David, he asked the same question. What is man that you are mindful of him? And then he answers, because you have made him. It is in that, the act of creation, that we are his children. We are the sheep of his pasture. And we all have infinite worth in his eyes. And that sh the sheep of his pasture, he's willing to leave 99 to go and pursue the one, the one who can't find the way, who doesn't know how to get home, doesn't know how to get back into the shelter of his arms. He looks for you. He will leave everything to go and find you. How do you find the real evidence that God exists, that Jesus is real, the stories about him are true? How do you really find that? through direct experience. God doesn't want your faith to be blind. He wants your faith to be based on the solid rock of your relationship with him. If you want that, if you want to remove all the questions and find that Jesus is the answer, here's a simple prayer for you. Jesus, if you're there, if you're real, if you really came for me, if you really are my savior, if you really are my Messiah, could you show me? Could you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, this isn't something you do casually. This isn't something you 
try to joke with God about. But if you really mean that, he'll show up. The Bible promises that he will manifest himself to you. If you want help with this prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us and say, I want to know Jesus, and I want to know him today. 1-800-700-7000 is the number. Call us now. Here's a word for you. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and in the weakness of God is stronger than men. God bless you. We'll see you again.